Well, hi, I'm Dave, and today I am with my wife, Michelle. Hi. And as many of you know, we are uh, newlyweds. We got married last August. And as we've been growing in our marriage and just learning how to communicate, how to love one another, uh, we have been reading a book that is uh, is helping us. And so today, it, the book is called The Five Love Languages. And so we are honored and uh, encouraged to have one of the best-selling authors of our time, uh, Dr. Gary Chapman with us today. The Five Love Languages has sold over 20 million copies. So Dr. Gary Chapman, such an honor to have you. Welcome to Disruptive Truth. Well, thank you, Dave and Michelle. It's great to be with you guys. Dr. Chapman, I, you know, as we were preparing for this, we just kind of pulled up some of, you know, we read the book, we took the test and we, you know, we, we saw clips of you all over. You were uh, sitting down with Oprah on one of them. And this book has been translated in so many different languages, uh, people around the world. In fact, Dr. Chapman, before the whole Will Smith incident, I was reading Will Smith's biography and he was saying that in his life with relationships and his marriage, when he was struggling, he read several books. And one of the books that he mentioned was The Five Love Languages. Dr. Chapman, did you ever envision that this book would be so successful and impact so many lives and so many uh, languages around the world? Short answer, no. <laughs> I knew I knew that the book would help people if they would read it and apply it because I had uh, been using it for at least five years in my counseling uh, before I actually wrote the book. And so I knew that the concept could change marriages, but had no idea that it would be translated, as you said, in now over 50 languages around the world and uh, sell millions of copies. So uh, it's, uh, I stand amazed at how God has used this book to uh, touch the lives of so many people. That's amazing. Dr. Chapman, you talk about in your book um, how easy it is to fall in love and how easy it is to fall out of love. Why is it so easy to fall in love and so easy to fall out of love today? Wait a second. It's not easy to fall out of love with me. Is Well, I think I think it's natural. Uh, we are made male and female and there is an internal attraction uh, to someone of the opposite sex. And I think uh, it's just a part of who we are. And it's true in, in humanity, wherever we go, it's, just, it's built into us. And uh, you don't decide one day, I think I'll fall in love. You meet someone and there's something about the way they look, the way they talk, the way they emote. It gives you what I call a little emotional tingle. <laughs> it's a positive tingle. Uh, and you want to see them again. And every time you get together, it gets stronger and stronger. And eventually it becomes an emotional obsession. You literally get obsessed with them. You can't get them off that. your mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you go to bed thinking about them. You wake up thinking about them all day long. You think about them in your mind. They are the most wonderful person you have ever met in your life. Now your mother can see their flaws. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> your mother will say, well, honey, have you considered they haven't had a steady job in five years? You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you will say, oh, mama, give them a break. They're just waiting for the right opportunity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in our minds, we're just uh, enamored with them. And so I think it's a natural phenomenon that happens to most people. I'm not saying necessarily everyone, but it happens to most people. And I think what we were not told and what I did not know when I got married is that we've now studied is that the average lifespan of that in love euphoria is two years, which means some a little longer, some a little less, but average two years. And we come down off that high. I think it's because we really cannot sustain that euphoric high uh, because it's hard to get anything else done when, you, when you're super, super in love. You, you're just so enamored with each other. And so we do come down off the high. I think it's a good thing. We don't choose it. We don't just say one day, I think I'll, I think I'll come down off the high. We don't choose it. It just kind of runs its course. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, what happens to so many people is that uh, as it come, begins to come down, uh, their differences emerge and they have conflicts and they end up arguing with each other. And now they, they have negative feelings toward each other. 
So now, not mm-hmm. only did they lose the positive, but now they have negative feelings toward each other. So, and, I, and my wife and I went through that. And I wish someone had told me that, that it's normal to come down off the high. Because I'd always been told, if you've got the real thing, it's going to last forever. And uh, yeah, I, like wife... in your book, <laughs> I like in your book how you say true love cannot begin until the in love experience has run out. Yeah. And true love is the intentional, not the under the influence obsession. Um, it's the intentional. It takes intentionality and um, discipline to show your spouse true love. Um, and one of the ways or the main way with the book is about is there's these five love languages um, that you can show your spouse true love, which is a choice. Um, can you tell us, Dr. Chapman, what are the five love languages? Yeah, and they're in no particular order of importance, but uh, one of them is words of affirmation, just choosing words to affirm them. You look nice in that outfit. I appreciate what you did. You know, one of the things I like about you is just using words to affirm things about them that you appreciate. There's an ancient Hebrew proverb that says life and death is in the power of the tongue. We can kill people by the way we talk to them, or we can give them life. And so words of affirmation. A second is acts of service, doing something for the other person that you know they would like for you to do. In a marriage, that would be such things as cooking meals, washing dishes, vacuuming floors, washing the car, mowing the grass, walking the dog, changing the baby's diaper. Ooh, that's a big one. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to learn that one here soon, Dr. Chapman. All right. All right. All right. right. You know, there's an old saying that says actions speak louder than words. If this is their love language, that is true. Actions will speak louder than words. Mm -hmm. And then number three is gifts. It's universal to give gifts as an expression of love. My academic background before I studied counseling uh, was anthropology, cultural anthropology, the study of cultures. We've never discovered a culture anywhere in the world where gift giving is not an expression of love. It's universal to give gifts. And for some people, this is their love language because the gift in their mind, they're saying, they were thinking about me. Look what they got for me. You see, it's communicating love to them, gifts. And then quality time, giving the other person your undivided attention. I do not mean sitting there watching television together. Someone else has your attention. I'm talking about TV is off, computer is down. We're not answering the phone. We're giving each other our full attention, listening and mm-hmm. speaking to each other. Or we're taking a walk down the road and talking, you know, not, not always sitting around talking. And it doesn't always have to be talking. It can be doing something with the other person that you know they would like for you to do and giving your full attention to it. It may be uh, planting a flower garden in the front yard uh, or going shopping with your spouse. And they just really like to go shopping and they want you to go with them. And be be into it, you know, into them as you're as you're shopping. So quality time. And then number five is physical touch. We've long known the emotional power of physical touch. That's why we pick up babies, hold them and kiss them and cuddle them. And long before the baby understands the meaning of the word love, the baby feels love by physical touch. So in marriage, we're talking about such things as holding hands, kissing, embracing, the whole sexual part of marriage, uh, arm around the shoulder. Driving down the road, you put your hand on their leg or sitting around the house and you trip you and they walk by and you trip them. You know? <laughs> no, 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 no. Erase that one. Erase that one. You don't trip your spouse, okay? No. So the basic idea, as you know, is out of the five, we each have a primary love language. And seldom does the husband and wife have the same language. So we may be speaking love to them and they don't get it because we're speaking our language and not their language. Well, Dr. Chapman, we took the little test and we, you know, read the end of the book and, and there's some good questions. And then also online, it kind of helps us to discover our love languages. And, and you talk about physical touch. And as a, you know, you know, being married, I, w- I was thinking that, you know, because I love making love to my wife, that well, that's probably physical touch, you know, but you make a <laughs> distinction between um, sexual touch and non-sexual touch. And as I was going through it, I discovered that my gift was actually acts of service that when Michelle keeps the house clean and when, you know, she cooks a meal for me and surprise, those things really are what make me feel so loved by her. 
Yeah. You know, I think a lot of men, when they hear the basic concept, will automatically say, oh, my love language is physical touch. And they're thinking about the sexual part of marriage. And I, that's when I say to them, well, maybe that is your love language. But let me ask you, do non-sexual touches make you feel loved? And first of all, they look at me like a deer in the headlights. You know, Are there non-sexual touches? <laughs> 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 and I say, OK, let's say that you walk, you get out of the car and you're walking into a shopping mall. And as you walk in, she reaches over and holds your hand. Does that make you feel loved? And if he says, mm, no, that kind of irritates me. I said, well, let's say she's pouring you a cup of coffee and she puts her hand on your shoulder. Does that make you feel loved? And if he says, mm, not really. I said, physical touch is not your love language, okay? You like the sexual part of marriage. I understand that, but it's not your love language. So uh, now these are not gender specific. A man can have any one of the five and a woman can have any one of the five because they're primary. Mm. Yes. Mine is physical touch. I think just when he holds my hand or anytime, you know, puts his hand on my shoulder, those speak louder than words, um, those little actions. But put my arm around you right <laughs> now. I've also, <laughs> my tied for second would be words of affirmation and quality time. Um, but it was interesting, just the other day, Dave asked me about my love tank, if I was feeling like my love tank was full. And as it should have been, because he was holding my hand and we were spending quality time together when he asked, I just had this sense that I was craving words of affirmation from him. Um, and that's not usually something that I feel like, especially when other needs are being met, that I would be craving. But since he asked me, I was able to think about it and answer, well, you know, I think I'm craving words of affirmation. And that gave him the opportunity to um, say that he loved me. But more than that he loved me. He said specifics. He's good with words. And he said specific things that he'd noticed that I had done around the house, or I love the way you take help your family. And I'm preparing for our baby that's coming soon. And he noticed little details like the bottles or in his room is organized and the burp cloths in the top drawer. Dr. Chapman, I didn't know this, but she has like burp cloths, like folded clean organized and like different <laughs> sizes of baby bottles like I, I had no idea about that but it took a lot of work and i thought you know i really appreciate those things but i have no clue but she does those and i really appreciate but it it was so. interesting how after that after he said those things how i felt like known and seen that he yeah. saw um, things about me that were unique and not just, I love you, you're beautiful, but things that I felt like were unique to me, yeah, um, yeah. which I also think is how the Lord sees us. We want to be uniquely, or we want our spouse to know, notice us and to see things about us that are unique. So, um, so is that a thing where maybe that's not your primary love language, but you're just feeling like that day you need something specific Yes, I think uh, any any one of these five can communicate love. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, who's going to turn away from any one of those? Uh, mm -hmm. But I think uh, if we don't speak the primary, the person will not feel loved. But if we speak the primary and, and, and then if, if the secondary is close to that, we speak the secondary. Yes, some of those others may on a given day kind of bubble to the top. You know, mm -hmm. today, this is what I'm feeling. Like. That's why I encourage couples to say uh, periodically, honey, on a scale of zero to ten, how full is your love tank? <laughs> and if they say anything less than 10, you say, what could I do today to help fill it? And now you know that today, this is what's meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, yeah, I think any one of the love languages can be meaningful. But if we don't focus on the primary, we're going to miss our objective of meeting their need for love. Dr. Chapman, how did you... Uh... How did you discover that like early in your marriage, even before you started counseling and teaching this to others, how did you discover these principles in your own marriage? Well, I didn't discover them in my marriage. I okay. wish I had. <laughs> I discovered them when I was counseling. Oh, uh, I remember the first time uh, this concept dawned on me, not the five languages, but that people speak different languages. Uh, a couple came in. They'd been married to each other for 30 years. I didn't know them. And uh, we talked for a bit and she told me some positive things about the marriage. And then she started crying mm. and she said, but Dr. Chapman, in spite of all those things, I just feel like he doesn't love me. And I feel so empty inside. 
And I looked over at him and he said, I don't understand that. And he told me all the things that he did, you know, to express love to her. And he said, I do all those things. And she says she doesn't feel love. And he said, I don't know what else to do. So I asked him specifically what he did. And he said, well, I get home from work before she does. So I actually start the evening meal. And sometimes I have it ready when she gets home. If not, she helps me. And then we eat. And he said, every night I wash the dishes. And every Thursday night, I vacuum the floor. And every Saturday, I wash the car. I mow the grass. I help her with the laundry. And he went on. And I was beginning to wonder, what does this woman do? <laughs> it sounded to me like he did everything. And he said, I do all of that. And she doesn't feel loved. And I looked back at her. And she started crying again. And she said, Dr. Chapman, he's right. He's a hardworking man. But we don't ever talk. We haven't mm -hmm. talked in 20 years. He's always washing dishes, vacuuming floors, you know, always doing something. Mm -hmm. And I realized he was a sincere husband who was loving his wife the best way he knew how and a wife who didn't get it. And after that, I heard similar stories over and over and over in my office. So I knew, I knew this was common. I knew there was a pattern, but I didn't know what it was. So eventually I took time to sit down and read several years of notes that I made when I was counseling and asked myself, when someone said, I feel like my spouse doesn't love me, what did they want? What were they complaining about? And their answers fell into five categories. And I later called them the five love languages. And I started using that in my counseling. If you want her to feel love, you've got to learn to communicate love in her language. If you want him to feel love, you've got to learn to speak his language. And I would help couples discover their love language, challenge them to go home and try it. And sometimes they would come back in three weeks and say, Gary, this is changing everything. Wow. The whole climate is different now. And then I use it with couples, you know, just small groups of couples. Same thing happened. So probably five years later, I thought if I could put this concept in a book, maybe I could help a lot of people. I would never have time to see my office. So that's that's how it developed. And uh, I wish I had known it when I got married, <laughs> but I didn't. So when you send someone home to discover their primary love language, how do you tell them that is the way, what is the way to discover your primary love language? Well, let me give you three informal ways. Number one, observe their behavior. How do they respond to you and other people? If they're always giving other people words of affirmation, you know, encouraging words, that's probably their language because we tend to speak our own language. If they're always giving gifts to people, probably their language is receiving gifts. So uh, observe their behavior. Secondly, what do they complain about most often? The complaint reveals the love language. Mm -hmm. If a wife says, we just don't ever have any time together anymore. I just feel like we're ships passing in the night. I mean, she's complaining that she doesn't get quality time. So that's her love language. If he says, I don't think you would ever touch me if I didn't initiate it, he's telling her that physical touch is his language. So what do they complain about? And thirdly, what do they request of you most often? If they're periodically saying, honey, could we take a walk this afternoon? They're asking you for quality time. If they're saying, you think we could get a weekend away, just the two of us? They're asking for quality time. Or if you get ready to go on a business trip and they say, be sure and bring me a surprise, they're telling you gifts is their language. If you put those three things together, you can pretty well figure out their love language and your own love language if you apply those to yourself. And then I think that you mentioned earlier that uh, you can go online and take a free quiz at fivelovelanguages.com. The number five, fivelovelanguages.com. In fact, my publisher told me the other day, 80 million people have taken that quiz. Wow, that's amazing. I told my 80. publisher, I said, you guys should have been charging a dollar a piece. You know? yeah. <laughs> yes. Wow. Oh, that is so, that's amazing. You've helped a lot of people. And I like the quiz because then you can see what your secondary yeah. uh, love language is as well. Or, um, and you see them in order, which makes sense. Um, in your book, you also mention um, you can speak the same love language as your spouse, even though it's rare, which I find interesting um, to have the same primary love language as your spouse. But um, you can speak a different dialect. Will you explain briefly uh, what is a dialect? Yeah, 
You know, just as in spoken language, there are dialects. I speak English, for example, with a Southern accent, okay? <laughs> people, in, people in Boston speak, speak it with a different accent. Yeah. And so in the love languages, uh, there are different ways uh, to express a given language. For example, a wife said to me some time ago, she said, Gary, my husband and I have the same primary love language. I said, well, great. Tell me what it is. And she said, acts of service. But she said, the things I want him to do for me that make me feel loved are different from the things he wants me to do for him to make him feel loved. So it's the same language. It's just different dialects. And so uh, if you do happen to have the same language, which doesn't happen very often, but if you do, it's important to talk about, well, if it's words of affirmation, what, what kind of words are most meaningful to you? Like you mentioned earlier, you can say, I love you, you know, and you're so kind and I love, I love the way you look and, and, and that maybe that communicates to some people more. But if they give specific things, like you mentioned earlier, that Dave gave specific things about you that he appreciated, uh, that's what makes them feel loved. So it's a little, little different nuance that I'm just calling a different dialect of that particular mm -hmm. language. Dr. Chapman, uh, as I've been, uh, my full-time day job is in medical cells, so I drive a lot. And I um, was listening to your audiobook, Life Lessons and Love Languages. And you earn a lot of degrees. You, uh, sounds, I think you went to Moody, and then you went to Wheaton College, and you went to Southeastern for a year, then you went to Southwestern. You studied anthropology at Wheaton College, and then later, as a college pastor, you took a, got another, I think, master's degree at uh, Wake, Forest, Wake Forest. So studying anthropology, how has that shaped and, and, and helped form this, this theory of the love languages? You know, I don't know that it helped form it, but it did uh, help me understand that the fundamental need for love is universal. Hmm. Like I was really shocked, for example, when the Spanish publisher came, they were the first that wanted to publish the book, uh, The Five Love Languages in Spanish. And I said to my publisher, look, I don't know if this works in Spanish because I'm sensitive to cultural differences. And I said, I discovered this in middle America. And they said, well, they've read the book and they want to publish it. I said, well, OK, then let's go with it. It became their bestseller. They sold, I don't remember, two or three million million copies. And so. Uh, I think that's that's where the anthropology came in for me. I actually took anthropology at Wheaton College because I was interested in being a missionary. And that's a great background if you're going to serve in another country. Uh, and the master's I took later on after I had my Ph.D. <laughs> took another master's in anthropology was really because I was working with college students. And I found out Wake Forest had a master's in anthropology. I thought, man, I'll just go in as a grad student. and I have a reason for being on campus. I can start Bible studies and have a ministry there. So. Uh, that's the role that uh, anthropology uh, played. But uh, anthropology is a good, cultural anthropology is a good study if you're going to work and understand other cultures. Very fascinating. And uh, no, Billy Graham uh, earned a degree in anthropology at Wheaton College as well. So that's very fascinating. How does your faith influence your theory, Dr. Chapman? Well, I think here's where faith comes in. When I, when I often speak on this, I say now, what I've given you is information on how to effectively communicate love to your spouse. I cannot give you motivation because love is a choice. You know, being in love is not a choice. I mean, we just get swept away into the euphoric feelings of being in love. But when you come down off that high, love becomes a choice. And love is an attitude. It's the attitude of I am in this relationship to do everything I can to enrich your life. And speaking your love language is, is one of them. So, and I, and I say at the end of my book, actually, uh, because many people say, I read your whole book and didn't know you were a Christian until I got to the end of it. <laughs> I said, good, that's what I, that's what I intended. <laughs> Understand the idea. And then I'm asking, where do you get your motivation? Mm -hmm. I get my motivation because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ who said about himself, I did not come to be served. I came to serve and obviously give my life a ransom for others. So if we choose the attitude of love, we're choosing an attitude every day. We're thinking, how can I enrich my spouse's life? How can I enhance their life? And this is one area in which you can do that in terms of meeting their need for love. But it's still your choice. In fact, I had a man say to me one day, he said, Dr. Chapman, my wife and I read your book. We took the quiz 
and her love language is acts of service. And I'm going to tell you and her, if it's going to take my washing dishes and vacuuming floors for her to feel loved, she can forget that. Wow. And I said, that's your choice. If you choose to live with a wife who has an empty love tank, that's your choice. I much prefer to live with a wife who has a full love tank. I've lived with both. Same woman. <laughs> Early years, empty love tank. Latter years, full mm -hmm. love tank. I said to me, washing dishes and vacuuming floors, small price, small price to pay to live with a happy woman. So, uh, you know, this is where faith comes in. And we're following the example of Christ who loved even the unlovely, which was really all of us, enough to die for us. Mm -hmm. And we have outside help because the Bible says the love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So we can become God's agents for loving even an unlovely spouse. In fact, that's the most powerful thing you can do for an unlovely spouse is to love them in the right love language over an extended period of time. Wow. wow, that's good. It's very encouraging, uh, Dr. Chapman. I'm I'm learning how to be a stepdad. Uh, Michelle has a nine year old, Sydney. She's a blessing to us, and now we have a little one on the way. Um, how does the five love languages apply to other relationships as a parent, as a yeah. as a, an employee? How do you apply the five love languages to other relationships? Well, it applies in all human relationships. That's why my second book in the series was The Five Love Languages of Children, helping parents effectively learn and speak the love language of the children. Mm -hmm. But I say in the children's book, please don't hear me saying you only speak a child's primary love language. No, no, no. Heavy doses of the primary, but you sprinkle in the other four because we want that child to learn how to receive love and later give love in all five languages. That's the healthiest child. And then I dealt with the five love languages of teenagers. Because parents would say, Dr. Chapman, we, we, we applied this when they were children, but now they're teenagers and it doesn't seem to be working. Does their love language change? And I said, I don't think the love language changes, but you have to use new dialects of their language because what you've been doing, they consider childish now. You know, maybe words was their language and you say, you sweet little thing, I just love you to death. Da, da, da. <laughs> and right. You try that with a teenager. They go, oh, God, no, 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 no. <laughs> yes. They have to learn new dialects. And also have a special edition for blended families because, you know, the relationship between a, a biological child and a stepchild is, is, is different emotionally. And so I wrote that one with uh, Ron Deal, who has spent 25 years working with blended families. And so it's still the principle is still there. But the nuance is you have to have to let that new that let that stepchild get to know you a bit before you, they might be ready to receive, you know, their, even their own primary love language. So anyway, uh, it just applies in all human relationships, as well as you mentioned, work relationships. What determines a child's love language? Is it is it nature or nurture? I've heard you touch on this I, before, but I'm curious. Yeah. I wish I knew. <laughs> I don't know. But I do know this. You can discover a child's primary love language by the time they're four years old, sometimes mm -hmm. even three, simply by observing their behavior. For example, when my son was that age, his, his language is physical touch. When I would come home, he would run to the door, grab my leg and climb on me. He's touching me because he wants to be touched. Our daughter never did that. She would say, Daddy, come into my room. I want to show you something. Her love language is quality time. She wanted my undivided attention. So it's there very early in a child's life. I don't know. Is it nature? Is it nurture? I don't know. I just know it's there early. Okay. Um, well, uh, let's see. Um, any other questions we want to ask? You know, one thing that maybe we could get you to do as we're finishing things up is we mentioned the love tank game. Maybe could you just give a summary of that? Um, yeah for our audience, because we referenced that, um, yeah. what is the love tank game? I think the love tank game is a way of checking with each other to see if the love tank is full. So you simply say every two or three weeks to your spouse, you know, in a, in a time when you can talk, honey, on a scale of zero to 10, how full is your love tank tonight or today? And they give you a number. 
if they say anything less than 10, you say, what could I do to help fill it? And they give you a suggestion, which may well be their primary love language, but it may on that particular day be one of the other love languages. But at least they're giving you information. By asking the question, you're saying to them, I care about you. I want to meet your need for love. And when they give you the answer, they're giving you information on how to effectively meet that need for love on that particular day. It's just a fun little game to play periodically with your spouse. Well, we have just started doing that and we uh, really enjoy it. And um, uh, it's helped us, but it's something we'll need to continue to do. And uh, so we can grow you know, closer. I have a lot to learn. I love the five love languages because it has you focus on the other person. You want to know what their love language is. But it's also, I think, extremely loving to your spouse to give them specific ways that they can love you better because it sets you up for success. Instead of holding it in and resenting, starting to resent your spouse, they may not even know you resent them or that you're frustrated with them. Um, because they're not showing you love in the right ways. But if you communicate to them what the, these are specific ways you can show me love, you're setting them up for success to love you better. You're also setting yourself up for success to love them better. So we love it. We've yes. really enjoyed reading it. So thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. And thank you for coming on the show. What is the best way for our listeners to get your book and um, to also to, to, uh, learn more about your resources? Well, they can go to fivelovelanguages.com, the number five, fivelovelanguages.com. And they can order it there. They can order it on Amazon. But at that website, fivelovelanguages.com, uh, they can sign up if they would like to receive a kind of a weekly little uh, email out from me, just kind of keeping things on the front burner uh, for them. Uh, and there's a lot of other stuff on there uh, about other books. So uh, that was, if you're looking for resources on how to grow in your marriage, uh, that love, that website would be a good one to go to. FiveLoveLanguages.com. Uh, Dr. Chapman, thank you so much for just uh, sharing with us and helping us understand. We are going to continue in this, and I'm going to subscribe as well. I've watched your videos. I've been to your site. So we look forward to that. And uh, just thank you so much for joining our show. It's amazing um, how God has used you in this book. Well, thank you, Dave and Michelle. It's great to be with you today. And uh, also, thanks for what you guys are doing. You know, you're getting started off on the track, not only of uh, learning yourselves, but also trying to help others. And that's what it's all about. I'm trying to get my family to read it now. Yep. <laughs> going to pass it around. And I want to read that book, that some of those others, the one about the workplace and the one about uh, blended families. Those are going to be great resources uh, for, for me uh, and also... Uh, you know, what's your latest book that you just wrote? You wrote a new one about the workplace as well. What's the title of that one? Yeah, it's called Making Things Right in the Workplace. Yes. It's dealing with uh, stress and misunderstandings and that sort of thing that develop in a workplace and make it unpleasant for those who are involved. So it's trying to deal with how do we how do we get that all back you know, on a positive note? Excellent. Well, that's great. Well, thank you, Dr. Chapman. We uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you. God bless. God bless.